if you want to write a book, write a book. Don't don't talk yourself out of it. Uh, and and like Barbara Streisand says, or Sesame Street says, in the old song, "Don't worry if it's not good enough, just sing." Well, don't worry if it's not good enough, just write. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It is your favorite time of the week, or at least my favorite time of the week, being here with all of you. As always, I am Andrew Dupy, Chief Relationship Officer at Leaders Press, and this is Leaders Talk. And today on Leaders Talk, I have with me a very special guest. I have Mark M. Bello. So let me actually introduce you to Mark. He has an interesting background. Mark is an attorney. He's an author. He's a civil justice advocate. Uh, Mark brings over four decades of legal experience uh, to his Zachary Blake legal thriller series. Uh, He's a Michigan native, and Mark's novels provide readers into a front row seat into a lawyer-client battles in the criminal justice systems. Uh, He combines deep passion for justice with unique creativity and a writing style that brings captivating novels to his readers. Uh, When Mark is not writing legal and political novels, he writes and posts legal and political blogs. He posts articles to his website and other online publications. In his spare time, Mark enjoys traveling, spending time with his family. Mark and his wife, Toby, have four children and eight grandchildren. Mark, it is impressive. Update, update on the grandchildren. We have nine grandchildren. Oh, another one on the way. <laughs> another, one, another one has arrived. Well, uh, may, you, you absolutely have a, a plethora of <laughs> blessings on you with all of that. Um, so tell me a little bit more about yourself. That's a really interesting background. More about myself. You well, you you kind of covered it. Um, <laughs> I pr- I practice law. I practice. <laughs> I practice law for a long time. Okay. Uh, I, as I told you in our pre-interview, I, I had yeah. a, a kind of a divided career. I practiced uh, for half the time that I've been a lawyer, mm-hmm. and I financed litigation uh, for a company that I own called Lawsuit Financial. Mm-hmm. For the second half of my career, so uh, my legal expertise in 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 handling and evaluating personal injury cases primarily uh, came in very handy in that career. Um, in my practice years, I handled a case of clergy abuse against two young uh, teenagers here in Michigan. Um, I was in my 30s at the time. It was at the beginning of my practice. And the experience was so troubling and interesting that I said to myself, self, one day you ought to write a book about this. And, and my concept was to write a nonfiction account of what it's like to handle a clergy abuse case. And it was just too difficult, uh, at least for me, to write it as a nonfiction account. Uh, and writing it as fiction allowed me to embellish a bit and, and be creative. Uh, so I wrote a, a, a fictional account, rather, of uh, what the experience felt like. And the result was my first novel. About 30 years later, at the age of 65, uh, I released Betrayal of Faith. And that began, that be, began my author career. Hmm. And that kind of brings you up to date other than we're now uh, 12 novels later, I guess. 12, <laughs> something like that. And, and that, that is awesome that you're able to actually embrace the writing process from, from that kind of background. And it's fascinating to me because when we talk about this, you know, you're talking about it, you, you came at it from a nonfiction standpoint but then approached it in the way to write a fiction book. So tell me a little bit about the reason that that was the, the approach that you decided to take. The, the David versus Goliath struggle mm. of that case where uh, these two young partners, uh, uh, my partner and I, uh, the Davids of the story, and the Catholic Church being the huge Goliath of the story, the um, I don't know uh, attempt to crush us uh, financially uh, with 
superior legal talent. And when I say superior, I mean uh, resources. Yeah. Not, not necessarily brains. <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a large law firm, a silk stocking, expensive law firm versus these two young uh, practitioners uh, was an interesting story. Uh, both from a nonfiction and a, and a fiction standpoint, but mm. the the thing that compelled me to write it as fiction was I couldn't escape the feeling that there's some clandestine um, entity behind it all that was pulling strings and making things disappear or reappear or making things difficult behind the scenes. Uh, and I created in the in the novel an organization called the Coalition, which is essentially the MI6 behind the church, uh, getting rid of evidence and witnesses and so on by quote any means possible. Hmm. And that made for very compelling fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's. It's interesting though because when you're when you're saying this, uh, I immediately go to my mind the concept of how all writing is storytelling, and this is something that we've mentioned many times on the podcast. Uh, even when we're talking about very strict, maybe what would some would consider to be dry business books, the way that you approach being able to relate to the audience to tell those stories is through storytelling. So that's kind of where it sounds like to me you're you're leading here is that maybe just doing a nonfiction account of, of what your legal process was might not be as catching, but when you're able to spice it up and bring the stories, you're able to get to the same point with a little bit of a different approach. Yeah. Well, yes. And, and it, it, it's more of what it felt like rather than what it was. Right. Uh, the other thing I, I would mention that I didn't mention or that you didn't mention in the intro is that I also have an English literature degree mm. pre pre law school, so I have that kind of literature creativity uh, background that that I think helped me a lot in in uh, novelizing mm. the actual experience. Is novelizing a word? I don't know. <laughs> it is I, now. If it isn't, if it isn't, I just created. It. Uh, ra rather than writing it as nonfiction, which I thought would, would be interesting to lawyers, but not interesting to the public, uh, this, this is a compelling uh, uh, story. Um, it's a, you know, it's a difficult, child abuse is not a, a fun topic. No. Uh, <laughs> early, early in my writing career, when I just started writing the novel, I, I, I picked up a few writing tool books, you know, how to. And the first one I picked up was a small little yellow book, uh, you know, how to write a novel or something like that. I don't remember. But the first line in the book was, uh, don't pick a topic that nobody wants to read about, like child abuse. And here I was writing a book about child abuse. So right. um, I, I, I uh, defied the common theory that, you know, write something that, that people um, would find entertaining. And I, I'm not sure child abuse is one of them, but what is entertaining about the book is the David versus Goliath story right. of a down and out lawyer uh, taking on the church, the Goliath church, um, and uh, trying to get justice for a uh, rather innocent, uh, family who whose faith uh, and and they were people of uh, of um, true faith whose faith was shattered by this, these events. Mm -hmm. uh, I spend very little time talking about the actual event that creates the lawsuit that is the center of the book, but. Um, the legal process, uh, what a lawyer and his clients have to go through when they fight uh, a large corporation, the government, a huge religious organization, whatever it may be, 
that experience is real. Mm. Uh, it's tough. It's very expensive. And they do try to crush you both uh, with legal talent and with a lot of money. And that story is told uh, very interestingly in Betrayal of Faith, my first novel. Something you mentioned, you, you said it, it may not be exactly what it was, but it's how you feel. So, you know, getting to the feeling of that story, it reminds me of other people who have done very similar things. Uh, I think we mentioned our pre-interview, uh, I talked about Ian Fleming a little bit. You know, he had done very similar things to what the character that he created, which was James Bond did. It's just he, he spiced it up to make some of his more mundane work when he was working for the OSS and, and, and the commandos you know, more, more entertaining for the public. I think of other authors, uh, uh, I've re read Flight of the Intruder, uh, things they carried, things like that, where the same thing, where you actually have people who are talking about their experiences, but they're, they're changing it up. So tell me a little bit about just the idea of, of being able to elicit feeling in the audience. Well, first of all, the, the, the legal aspects of the story mm. are Pretty accurate. Uh, uh, I didn't try the actual case. There is right. a trial in the book. And, and you and I both know, if you're, if you're going to write a legal novel, a, a trial is a good thing to have. A trial yeah. is an exciting- <laughs> You got to have the catharsis, right, yeah. And, and not all my books include a, a, a trial like this one did, mm. but the trial aspects of this book are very compelling. It, it's it's an interesting case to try, and it and the tale of the trial is a very interesting part of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but to answer your question, which is the inspiration for um, inventing this clandestine organization, is as I indicated earlier, it just felt to me that the average everyday bishop or priest or administrator for a church would not behave the way these people did. Right. Who's pulling the strings? Yeah. And I decided maybe it isn't your typical priest or your typical archbishop or your typical anybody. It's this clandestine MI6, MI5, CIA type organization that uh, enhances the image of the church by any means possible. And that was the coalition in, in the novel. Uh, by the way, the other thing I didn't do, even though the experience, as I describe each um, uh, person, uh, it's very obvious that I'm that the case I had dealt with the Catholic Church, but the book doesn't say that I'm dealing with the Catholic Church. It only says I'm dealing with the quote church. Yeah. <laughs> um, I never mentioned the word Catholic in the book. I did that because even though it's pretty transparent that the book is relating a, an experience with the Catholic Church, I figure that these kinds of events can happen anywhere. Uh, they've happened in the Boy Scouts. Uh, there was an incident with a rabbi. Uh, there, there are incidents, uh, there was an incident with a, um, a Lutheran uh, organization, one of, one of the synods. Uh, it's not unique to the Catholic Church, it seems to be more prevalent. Uh, it's been a bigger scandal with the Catholic Church, but I, di I didn't want it to be uh, Bellows picking on the Catholics. Uh, so, I, <laughs> yeah. so I left the word Catholic out. Uh, that doesn't mean that it wasn't the Catholic Church. And all of the uh, clerics in the book are bishops or archbishops or priests. And it, it uses uh, the uh, Catholic vernacular. Uh, so I, I, it's pretty transparent that it's Catholic, but I didn't use the word Catholic in the book. But what it, but it, what it felt like was, who's doing this? Who's 
who's transferring people out of town? Who's hiding evidence? Who's, caught, who's telling the Archbishop of Detroit to lie to me under oath? Who's doing these things? And, you know, when you think about it that way, mm. it makes for compelling fiction. Uh, right. Sometimes sometimes truth is, is, is more entertaining or more interesting than fact, or uh, than fiction, rather. But, but um, I just felt it would be, uh, if I had the ability to embellish a bit, and I did, and believe me, the book is highly embellished, um, this is how it felt uh, to somebody who has, uh, let's say, a creative mind. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's about the best way I could explain it. Oh, yeah. I, I think it, it makes it very clear because, yeah, you, you want to actually be able to take the things that you, you think were out there and, and be able to put it into something that relates to the audience. Um, so let's take a little bit of a different tack. I want to talk a little bit about the writing process, because you said you had a background in uh, literature. You obviously have a legal background. And what was it like actually sitting down and starting your first book and making that decision that I'm actually going to write this thing and get it done? Well, life got in the way, first of all. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had a family, as we just talked about. The uh practice of law is time consuming uh, raising a family is time consuming i had no time to write a novel so when i say it was a bucket list item i mean it it was a bucket list item mm -hmm. it was in the back of my mind i uh i finished the case back in 1987-88 i didn't write the book until 2016 uh, writing the book was a process that started in about 2000, 2001. And I sat down and wrote some notes. And then I sat down and put some notes into chapters. And then I sat down and said, boy, this is a piece of crap. I think <laughs> I'll, I think I'll uh, actually sit down and write it in earnest. And then I put it down and picked it up. And it, it, it wasn't until 2015, 2016, that I actually wrote uh, a novel in earnest, um, had it edited, had it re-edited, and then re-edited the edit, um, because I wasn't satisfied with what they did. And the result was a betrayal of faith. Recently, having written now and I think we talked about this also mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, in the pre-interview. Recently, I picked up the book and said, I'm going to read this. And I read it and I said, boy, this book has a lot of superfluous fluff, for lack of a better mm -hmm. way to say it. Uh, I consider myself now seven years later and 11 books, uh, nine Zachary Blake novels, a cozy mystery, uh, two children's books, I guess 12. Um, I consider myself a better author. So I actually rewrote Betrayal of Faith and I'm going to re-release. I, I take it back. I'm not going to re-release it because you lose 453 reviews if you do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to repost uh, the new content. Uh, whether I call it a second edition or not, I don't know. But uh, 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 alert to to your uh, listeners and viewers. Uh, they might want to wait two weeks to a month and purchase the streamlined, rewritten version of Betrayal of Faith. Uh, and I'm really proud of the new version. It's 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 um, it takes away some of the stuff that I think I would write. I wouldn't have written today. Right. Uh, as an as a brand new author, uh, there's a lot of legal content that is more technical than a, a typical novel reader wants to read, and I took most of that stuff out. It, I still explain the law. I still explain why Zachary Blake does what he does and how he does what he does. I think explaining to people legal concepts 
and what lawyers are thinking when they're handling cases is important. But, but uh, you know, for instance, just to give you an example, I, I posted the complaint and a, and a letter that Zachary wrote to the other side. I posted them verbatim. It, is, it just isn't necessary or interesting. And, I, and it took out a thousand words. <laughs> so th th things like that. It's, it's, a, it's a much, uh, it's a condensed version of, of what was a good novel. It's won a lot of awards. It's got 453 reviews. It's got a 4.7 rating on Amazon. I'm not suggesting in any way, shape or form that it's a bad novel as it is, but it's a better novel as it is now. Yeah. And I think that's the point that uh, that would probably resonate the most with our uh, our audience, because many of them are thinking about beginning, whether it's going to be a novel or a nonfiction book. But yeah, once you actually start the writing process, once you actually pull that, rip that Band-Aid off and sit down and actually begin doing it, you start leveling up right then. <laughs> well, I, I would suggest to, to those people who listen to your show that are authors, I would suggest uh, two things that we met, that we discussed uh, in the pre-interview, I think, because um, I discuss them quite often. But but thing one is just just do it. Yeah. If you want to write a book, write a book. Don't don't talk yourself out of it. Uh, and and like Barbara Streisand says, or Sesame Street says, in the old song, "Don't worry if it's not good enough, just sing." Well, don't worry if it's not good enough, just write. Um, Write it, write it for yourself first. Uh, don't worry whether, whether it's good enough or not. And the second thing is that you don't have to consider it to be finished, even though it's finished. Mm -hmm. With print on demand and, and uh, sites like Amazon or Ingram Sparks or draft to digital you can take content off and put content back on. So... If for some reason or other you find yourself five years later, six years later, seven years later, a little dissatisfied with what you wrote, you have the absolute right, uh, contrary to way, the way it used to be, you have the absolute right and ability to write it again or write it differently. And that's what I did with Betrayal of Faith. The, um, the interesting thing to me, uh, aside from what we're talking about, was okay, I wrote novel one based on a personal experience. Mm -hmm. Do I ever have a novel two in me? Do I have a novel three in me? Do I have a novel four or a novel nine? That's the shock of my life. I thought I was going to be a one and done author. And writing that book uh, based on a personal experience was something I planned to do and, and did, and I was proud of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I had another novel in me. And the only reason a second novel came is because the 2016 election came along. And I thought of a great idea for a novel too, based on the 2016 election. So I wrote Betrayal of Justice, which is a fictional account of the 2016 election and what it's like to have a self-professed bigot become president of the United States. Now, you can like Donald Trump or not like Donald Trump, and I'm not talking about Donald Trump per se, mm. but he said some things that, make, that made some people think he was a bigot. He wanted to ban all Muslims. He wanted to create a, a, a wall at the, on the border. Um, and so I created a fictional president that wanted to do what he wanted to do on steroids. Right. It's not based on Donald Trump. I want everybody to know. Uh, uh, somebody accused me of doing a hit job on Donald Trump. And I said, no, I, I wrote a fictional account of a fictional president. If you yeah. guys see a similarity between him and my fictional guy, <laughs> that's on him, not on me. Yeah. Uh, but once, once I was able to write a book based on a topic in the news, uh, that became my mantra. That became what I what I started to do, book after book after book. Yeah, I wrote a book about uh, a cop shooting an innocent black man. I wrote a book about a school shooting. 
I wrote a book about the immigration crisis uh, from mm -hmm. two points of view. Uh, so I wrote a book about the Supreme Court and a Supreme Court justice who has a sexual assault in his past. Um, not Kavanaugh, but, but Kavanaugh was the inspiration for the idea. Right. So that has been the stories of my life uh, post that first novel. Yeah, and I think I think you can see the value in that. I mean, that was the that's basically the writing style of you know you go back to the '60s, uh, Rod Serling, uh, Gene Roddenberry. You know, they did that with with Twilight Zone, Star Trek. They weren't talking about specific people. They were putting though uh, similar situations in which you know, they were really kind of just getting to the meat of everything uh, of the the issues underneath what was going on, right? Without actually naming names or doing anything. And if you saw similarities well, that was you said them right yeah absolutely yeah you know do um, i have do i have a left-leaning point of view i i suppose i do but it, but it's it, it's it really is you know if, if you see that 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 artist uh a painting behind me it's a, it's the scene where um atticus finch walks out of court hmm. um after uh tom uh Robinson is found guilty, and the and the gentleman in the balcony says, "Stand up, your father's passing." Uh, to kill a mockingbird made me want to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. To kill a mockingbird today is on the banned book list. Oh yeah, uh, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> uh, and, and, we we yeah we're in agreement there for sure. Uh, so I would suggest to all authors keep writing. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, if, if, if your writing is banned, then you're in a, in a uh, class with Harper Lee. Congratulations. <laughs> and many, <laughs> uh, yeah, and many others. <laughs> J.D. Yeah. Salinger, Cormac McCarthy, a lot of, a lot of great right. ones. <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote a children's book on a, 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 about a biracial kid who was, who was bullied. I would imagine that Ron DeSantis would want to ban that in Florida. I don't know. <laughs> so, so those things bother me. And whether it's a Republican or a Democrat doing it, it happens to be a Republican in Florida. Uh, but, you know, you start banning books and you start uh, limiting expression. Uh, you're, you're limiting our freedoms. And you're on my list if you do that. <laughs> well, I know well, this Mark, is the political show, but uh, but yeah, I, you know, my, books do have a, yeah. my books do have a political slant. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of that, uh, where can our audience find more about you? Markmbello.com okay. uh, is one place. Uh, Amazon uh, has my books, uh, and I have a an author's page on Amazon that lists all my books. Um. They're on Kobo, they're on Barnes and Noble and you know, any online bookseller. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a self-published author, so uh, they're not in, in most bookstores. People can request them in bookstores and a bookstore will order them for you if you want a, a print version. Uh, but that's essentially where you find my books, all online booksellers. If you Google People Mark Umbello, you'll find my books. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Mark. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, the links are there available down below. So follow those through. Give uh, some of Marie. I, I think you found a new member of your reading audience and myself. So I think Thank I'll you. be making a couple of purchases you, for, uh, for my reader. Uh, Mark, uh, we are out of time for the day, but I really appreciate having you. There's a lot of enlightening information for our audience that I think that they can find very useful. And we absolutely appreciate it. Wish you the best of luck in your future books. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.